In four days from now, the Philippines heads to the polls. The election is being seen as one of the most consequential in the archipelago's history, a potential make or break for the young democracy. The island nation will be deciding who will take over from President Rodrigo Duterte for the next six years. The 67.5 million eligible voters are casting their ballots for choosing the next president, vice president, 12 senators, 300 lower house legislators and around 18,000 officials across 7,600 islands, including mayors, governors and their deputies. Each voter must select one candidate for each post from President, Vice President and Senate all the way down to their local district councillors. The winners serve three-year terms except for the President, Vice President and the Senators who serve for six years. For years now, Filipino nationalism and the electoral politics have been associated with the colours red, blue and yellow. The colours define parties, candidates, allies and territories. This year, the opinion polls say it is a red-green coalition wave. Its front-runner is Ferdinand Bongbong Marcus Jr. Marcus Jr. is the son and namesake of former Philippines dictator Ferdinand Marcos, who was overthrown in a 1986 people power uprising. A former governor, congressman and senator, Marcus is a political heavyweight from a family with deep pockets and powerful connections. Marcos Jr. has picked red as his campaign color. Red benefits from its strong links to Filipino nationalism. Together, he is campaigning with Sara Duterte, the former Davao mayor and daughter of the outgoing president. She is eyeing the post of the vice president. The Marcos Duterte camp is campaigning with red and green colors. Sara Duterte abandoned her father's use of red in the 2016 polls, opting for green instead. Experts say red and green opposites on the color wheel are targeting different geographical terrains with Marcos campaigning in the north and Duterte in the south. Critics say Marcos winning the presidency is the family's endgame in whitewashing its past and changing narratives of authoritarianism, blunder and opulent living. Marcos Jr. has also been unabashed in praising his late father for what he calls a genius leadership. His campaign message is unity and steering the country out of an economic meltdown caused by the pandemic. He has also promised to create employment. The red-green coalition is facing off against a pink wave and leading it is Lenny Robredo, the closest rival of Marcos Jr., Rodreto beat Marcos in the 2016 vice presidential election. She is a former human rights lawyer and staunch liberal. As vice president, she has led campaigns against poverty and gender inequality. In recent weeks, Lenny Robredo's pink wave has seen mammoth rallies. Through the color pink, she is breaking away from her old affiliation with the Liberal Party, which was characterized by yellow. Robredo was, has clearly defined her mission, which is to unite the opposition and the dissenting voices against the sitting president, Duterte. Her campaigns have focused on ending corruption, bringing greater rights to women, better governance and an end to a culture of violence. There are other candidates as well, including Manila Mayor Francisco Isco Moreno Domagoso, retired boxing champion Mani Pacquiao and Panfilo Lakson, a former police chief. They, however, have consistently trailed in the polls. The contest has clearly become a two-way race between Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and Lenny Robredo. Marcos Jr. has been a clear leader in all opinion polls this year. Marcos, the front-runner, has been leading in the surveys with 56% support. Robredo is in second place with 23% support. Vote buying, political violence and occasional glitches with the EVMs have been common issues in the Philippines elections. However, critics say fraud on the level that would cast doubts on the credibility of the polls or their outcome is very unlikely.
As the candidates wrap up campaigning this week ahead of the May 9 elections, it remains to be seen whether Philippine politics will accommodate pink or will it be the typical red, blue and yellow. And with us on the broadcast is Don McLean Gill, a resident fellow at Manila-based International Development and Security Cooperation. Uh, he is a geopolitical analyst and author specializing in India, Southeast Asian relations and Philippine foreign policy. Hi, Don. Welcome to We On. Thank you so much for having me here. And it's a true pleasure uh, to take part in this discussion. Thank you. Now, give us a sense of the key issues on the voters' minds. Uh, what would you say is tilting the balance in favor of Marcos Jr. at this point? Yes, thank you for that very relevant question. And in fact, while many tend to focus primarily on just the individuals, the candidates themselves, I think it's necessary to take a step back and really look into the bigger picture uh, particularly three major points which I'd like to highlight very briefly, uh, which can be interpreted as the reasons uh, for the lead of former Senator Mr. Bongbong Marcos. Um, the first would be the issue of power bases. Uh, the second would be the demographic, demographic factor. And the third would be the particular campaign strategies uh, utilized. So with regard to the power base, uh, if I may expound, you know, the conditions for the rise of the Uniteam campaign, uh, Marcos and Duterte, uh, were significantly set before campaign season. In fact, uh, as we all know, President Duterte was able to amass strong support uh, from political elite groups and the public. So this was also seen with his victory in 2016 and has set the tone for a stronger impetus for the campaign of uh, Marcos and Duterte. Now, second to that is that Marcos already has maintained a strong and existing power base and the convergences of interest with the, with the current Duterte administration has played significantly to his favor. The second point I'd like to briefly mention is the demographic factor. Uh, we can see, of course, the use of social media. Uh, Mr. Marcos has a significant following in all these platforms and he has used them uh, particularly for direct engagement with the people. And the third, and I believe the most uh, important and most critical, is the campaign strategy. Uh, while many have been uh, observing, of course, particularly uh, Vice President Robredo's team, uh, there have been uh, significant speculations and, of course, observations regarding negative campaigning. Now, if we go back to the Liberal Party, as you have rightfully mentioned earlier, uh, the Liberal Party lost significantly in 2016, uh, the presidential elections and the midterm elections after that. Interestingly, the whole idea of the Liberal Party was using a binary approach of moral or immoral, good or bad, and this did not really go well uh, for the majority of the people, the, the Filipinos. And while Vice President Roberto tried to set a new tone, choosing pink over yellow as a sign of independence from that, uh, as we can see, the strategy of, uh, of negative campaigning and really mudslinging really sort of carried on with the pattern. So last year, for example, she said, uh, that she was running for president in order to prevent uh, Ferdinand Bongo Marcos from winning the presidency. And there also seems to be constant attempts to paint the other party as immoral or bad by the Robredo camp. So while some voters may not be diehard supporters of Marcos, or some may even be undecided, uh, they often opt to side with the uni team uh, due to their abhorrence, of course, towards the binary approach. Right. And this approach, as we can see, uh, leads to the label of them being immoral, which really does not set well for them. So this has been a major significant factor uh, for Team Marcos and Duterte to maintain that significant position. And how can I not bring up foreign policy? Uh, Don, uh, what about the country's relationship with India and China? What would that look like if Marcos does emerge victorious? And that is a, a very important question and, in fact, a very relevant question. Uh, if we look at the China, for example, and the overarching foreign policy trajectory of the of Team Marcos really looks into more continuation and change uh, with regards to the independent foreign policy of President Rodrigo Duterte. So we can see the independent foreign policy looks into diversification. So that's a plus point. And as we can see, first of all, with China, 
uh, we all notice that there is a positive perception towards China from the Marcus camp. So there are chances of downplaying the tribunal victory and maintain cooperative relations with China, just like President Duterte. Uh, and of course, with regards to India, there is a significant factor as, pres uh, as uh, former uh, Senator Mr. Marcus has emphasized when asked about the Quad that he is willing, of course, to engage proactively with other major powers, including India, as long as the national interest uh, and, of course, the, uh, the alliance with the United States is kept intact. And this, I believe, is perfect uh, and fits in rightly with the India-Philippine Strategic Partnership uh, with India's uh, specialization and adherence to the principle of strategic autonomy. And of course, um, uh, diversification of partners would also mean uh, that India also promotes cooperation based on uh, similar concerns and interests and veers away from block politics, uh, which the Philippines uh, from the President Duterte has been trying to avoid. So this really goes in line with the diversification process and since President Duterte's reign, actually, uh, the presidency, we have seen a significant uh, impact, positive impact on India-Philippines relations on defense, economics, health care, etc. And uh, I believe that the, the momentum will sustain and may in fact grow stronger uh, for both democracies to really work together uh, on common goals. Don McLean Gill, appreciate very much joining us on the broadcast with those perspectives. Thank you so much.